Um, well, welcome everyone. We are glad that you are joining us this evening. I am Shailen Farnsworth from the News Literacy Project. I'm the Senior Director of Partnership Strategy. Uh, myself and my teammates, Aaron and Brittany, who you see in the chat, are here to support educators across the nation, districts, um, state level and reg regional level agencies. Uh, we help educators use all of our free educator resources and programs. Um, so we are glad that you are joining us here this evening. Um, we are the News Literacy Project, a nonprofit, nonpartisan education organization, and we are founded in 2008. Um, we believe that education is the most effective approach because it empowers people to think for themselves and to recognize credible sources of information as well as misinformation. News literacy education empowers people to take responsibilities for their information habits and help stop the spread of harmful misinformation. Because of this, we believe it should be a graduation requirement so that all students will graduate with a smart, active consumer skills of news and information literacy and that they're informed and engaged and empowered individuals. Um, so we hope that you walk away knowing that NLP supports educators and uh, we teach students how to think about news and information, not what to think. Um, but we are, are thrilled to have two of our colleagues joining us this afternoon. Um, Peter Adams, Senior Vice President of Research and Design, um, and uh, his colleague, Hannah Covington, the Senior Manager of Education and Design. Um, Peter and his team support uh, across the org, really, um, if you think about it, but all of the wonderful materials, all of the research connecting with our subject matter experts, uh, the frameworks. So what else would you add to that list, Peter? Oh, you know, just uh, driving a lot of the work around um, supporting educators with, with links and publishing the SIFT and Get Smart About News uh, and driving forward the work on Rumor Guard, which we're going to talk a little bit about tonight and the examples of misinformation that you can use in your classroom. Uh, and then just, just kind of tracking new trends and research, debates in journalism uh, and research around this and disinformation, of course. So I'm happy to be here tonight to, to do that with Hannah uh, tonight. Yes, yeah, so um, we are thrilled, like I said, to have you here. Uh, not only do we have a landing page for Misinfo 101, um, which this, this webinar is kind of anchoring, uh, but we have a new course and the highlight on the course is actually led by Hannah. So you will learn more about that exercise later um, that, that we are excited to bring to you. Um, it's a great way to help your students um, uh, gain skills. Uh, in a listicle form. That's what I love about it, Hannah. But before they enter the wilds of summer and they're prepared to, to have all these skills, have all these tips um, that they can count on, kind of uh, think about when they're consuming on, online information. Um, but, but Peter, you're going to help set the stage. Um, and so uh, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and also, uh, if you have um, something that to comment on, please put it in the chat. When time permits, then we will uh, answer some of those questions. But um, yeah, Peter, take it away. Great. Let me just uh, share my slides here. Is everybody seeing that? Shailene, does this look okay to you? Yep, looks great. All right, great. So I'm going to just um, dive right in and just talk about some strategies and approaches for teaching about misinformation, talk a little bit about how to engage students uh, around uh, mis and disinformation, um, and some best practices and approaches that you might use and some resources that, uh, that you have available um, through NLP, and then hand off to, to my colleague Hannah uh, to talk more about evaluating sources. So I'm sort of teeing up that part of it um, as well. So a lot of the examples of misinformation that I'm citing tonight will are, have been featured and written about on uh, RumorGuard. Uh, this is NLP's um, uh, platform to use uh, curated examples of misinformation uh, to summarize, publish fact checks about those to really explain not just what's true and false, but how we know it's true and false, uh, but more importantly, then add a takeaway uh, to each rumor. So what kind of news literacy insights are made available by each example? What should you take away from that? I think it's a great resource um, for the broader public, but also for educators who can sort of take those takeaways and turn them into quick 
do nows uh, or even extend them out into a, into a lesson. Rumor guard entries are organized around five factors of digital verification, authenticity, source, evidence, context, and reasoning. So we also have quick uh, um, uh, snippets uh, uh, for each entry around those five factors. So when and where, you know, three of those factors are relevant in an example, we, we offer some in additional insight there as well. So I thought I would dive right in and I thought I would start um, with TikTok and Bud Light because uh, what better place is there to start uh, uh, anytime? Uh, so um, let's just take a look at this, this TikTok that, that circulated in the wake of, uh, of a partisan controversy around um, Bud Light uh, working with a, a transgender influencer, Dylan Mulvaney, uh, who um, uh, did a collaboration with Bud Light um, using a, a, some social media posts to promote, uh, to promote Bud Light um, on her channel. So let's just take a look at some of the response here. Uh, this claim uh, is that uh, partisans are, are bulldozing Bud Light in response uh, to this controversy. Um, it kind of looks like this. The volume's a little bit low because there's some cursing in the music, so wanted to be sensitive to that. But it's, you know, it shows a, a steamroller uh, going over cans of many, many cans of what appear to be beer. Um, but uh, this is presented in a, in a false context, right? So this has gone viral, not just on TikTok, but the TikTok has made its way to Twitter and to Facebook and to Instagram Reels and elsewhere. Uh, and it includes that close up uh, of Bud Light. So it seems like, hey, somebody is really, you know, destroying large quantities of Bud Light in protest, um, but it's actually footage um, from uh, Mexicali, uh, um, Mexico, uh, back in, February of 2023, so February of this year, but months before the Bud Light Mulvaney controversy uh, erupted. Um, and if you do a quick search, you can find out more about that incident, right? So a quick lateral search, which um, McCann will talk a little bit about as well. Um, just getting back to, uh, to some solid sources here uh, and some standards-based sources to figure out kind of what was shown there. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene also got in on the Bud Light controversy after uh, Senator Lindsey Graham uh, criticized her over comments that she made um, uh, concerning the, the leak of classified um, materials uh, by, by a National Guardsman um, in recent weeks, uh, tweeting this uh, out in response. No, no comment, no text, just a, just a photo. Uh, and it has uh, Lindsey Graham, Senator Graham, holding that commemorative can. It's a commemorative can that Bud Light didn't produce and sell, didn't mass produce and sell, uh, but did produce uh, for Mulvaney to feature uh, in some of her posts. And um, uh, this is a, a doctored image. So the authentic image, if you do a quick reverse image search or, or hunt down a fact check about it, is here. It's just a, a, an incredibly poorly drawn pint of beer uh, at an event in October 2015. Um, but a, a pretty convincing fake at a glance. Of course, it's really hard to know um, Green's intent. It's hard to know um, uh, how obvious she thought this piece of parody or satire was. Um, but you can tell from many of the comments on her post and on, on other uh, instances of this same photo that a lot of folks did, in fact, um, believe that it was authentic. Um, and so it, it just raises a lot of interesting questions. And you know, you can always take these questions up with students, the ethics of sharing something like that without a label. Um, I saw this on Twitter last night. It's a video that purports to be a uh, quote right now um, in Chicago, showing a store that's been ransacked with an alarm going off, broken glass. Um, and this is this is false. This is also out of context. Uh, this was uh, actually a, a video that was shot at a store in the wake of uh, in, in June 2020, um, after uh, the, the murder of George Floyd and some of the aftermath here in Chicago uh, of that incident. Um, and so, uh, it, it, but it circulated pretty broadly last night. And if you if you you know hunt down this tweet and look at some of the replies, there are a lot of replies about. Uh, Chicago politicians, about the state of Chicago, people drawing conclusions based on this purported uh, evidence. We've also seen a lot of falsehoods around uh, President Trump and his legal issues. 
um, when he announced uh, that that uh, he was to be arrested, that sparked a lot of folks to to create fakes, uh, including this doctored image of of a purported mugshot. Um, many people again didn't understand uh, the intent behind this if it was supposed to be parody or satire. And again, it's very hard to know. Um, but the impact is clear if you look at some of the comments uh, on uh, iterations of this that circulated pretty broadly. Um, after uh, uh, a recent mass shooting, um, this tweet circulated featuring an image, it's hard to see, I know, of uh, identical tweets from Ted Cruz with just different dates. Uh, and the claim is that, that Senator Cruz tweets the same uh, condolences, the same verbatim statement after every mass shooting. So you can see it starts with Uvalde and then in New York, in Sacramento, in El Paso, in Rochester, in Indianapolis and so on, Virginia Beach. Um, but it's actually a, a, a doctored image itself. Um, it's based on an accurate, uh, authentic tweet. This is um, Ted Cruz's tweet uh, after uh, Uvalde. Uh, but uh, someone then took that text and created a, a series of fake tweets and just changed the city, um, uh, perhaps as, a, as an act of uh, uh, partisan commentary or activism. It's hard to know. Um, but uh, this person, again, circulating that. And you can see the impact is significant or the reach is significant. You can see at the bottom 1.2 million people uh, or 1.2 million views on this particular post. Uh, um, that's a that's a significant um, exposure, right? And so and that's just this particular instance. The, the meme itself is then copied and circulated elsewhere and again uh, across platforms. So this information doesn't stay on one platform these days. It's, it's often uh, almost always captured and shared across um, platforms. So this tweet or that image over to Instagram or featured on TikTok uh, and so on. Um, this video also uh, uh, um, hit uh, in recent weeks. Uh, I'll just let it play and then, then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this example here. You know, people might be surprised to hear me say this, but I actually like Ron DeSantis a lot. Yeah, I know. I'd say he's just the kind of guy this country needs, and I really mean that. If Ron DeSantis got installed as president, I'd be fine with that. I mean, the one thing I know about Ron is that when push comes to shove, Ron does what he's told. And I can't think of anything more important All than right, that. All right, so what are some of the Hail things? Hydra. This is the chat, if you don't mind. And tell me just a few things you notice uh, about this particular example, what your thoughts are, what you might be thinking if you uh, engaged with this or saw this on, on Twitter. Patrick says AI generated. Kimberly points out it's out of sync. Yeah, the syncing is, is out uh, or the, the audio is out of step. Her mouth doesn't match the words. Seems like a deep fake. Voice feels flat, face looks manipulated. What else do you notice? Does anybody see you know, any other signs besides the quality of the video uh, and the audio syncing that looks off uh, or that might give you a clue as to what this is? Ramble Rants, so what about Heather? Tell me more about Ramble Rants. What about Ramble Rants just as a source? Raises some questions, right? And of course, these days you don't know what that blue check mark means. Right, Hail Hydra, correct, that's a Captain America reference. Right, and Heather points out, it's not a, it's not a standards-based source of information, Ramble Rants. We just don't know what that is. Doesn't seem particularly serious. You can also notice in the lower, uh, in the lower third of the, or the Chiron below MSNBC, uh, Ramble Rants has added uh, their name or their handle uh, and then also C3P meme, which is another username. So if you're watching carefully through the video, uh, that lower third changes here um, and, uh, you know, makes it clear that this too has, has been doctored. Uh, this is a deep fake video. It is based on a, an actual interview. Um, and of course, deep fake generators take a basis video or an authentic video and then manipulate it. They learn how, in this case, Clinton has moved her mouth in this particular video, and then they manipulate the original video to match audio that has been generated in their deep fake tools that help you mimic someone's voice. And you can generate fake audio for them. 
Uh, and again, a quick, a quick uh, click on Ramble Rants is not a bad step, right? On the source of the, the information or the account that shared it, raises even more questions. There's a link there and becomes pretty clear that uh, this is someone who shares political memes and engages in, in uh, what, they, what they probably claim is political satire. There's another image that circulated recently. I don't know how many people saw um, Pope in a puffy, uh, but this circulated in late March. Um, got a lot of traction, fooled a lot of folks, fooled a lot of savvy uh, people. Um, even some mis and disinformation researchers did a double take and, and thought it was real for a minute. Uh, this is actually AI generated. Um, this is a completely fabricated image um, using a, 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 a new uh, a tool called Midjourney. Um, and if you, again, click on the source of that, the person who shared it, it gives you some, some, uh, some context and some clues uh, that uh, this was maybe not shared in, in good faith and is not an authentic image, certainly something to be wary of. So I wanted to pause a little and just, just touch on a few things. I know we don't have a ton of time to, to dig into this and we could do an entire session, obviously, on AI and some of the changes we've seen in recent weeks. Um, in recent months, but um, large language models have gotten a, a whole lot of press, especially ChatGPT and also Bing's chatbot that's powered by ChatGPT and Google, uh, Google Bard. Uh, and these are um, uh, natural language on um, deep learning neural networks that can respond to a, a prompt and have a conversation with you or what feels like a conversation. Um, they're trained on a massive body of information. So a significant chunk of the internet, including books and websites and articles, um, and they are often referred to by even by their creators as black boxes. Once um, they, 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 they are turned loose and, and um, begin to sort of generate answers and learn from uh, their engagements with humans how their answers land, um, they continue to learn and, and even their creators aren't quite sure um, exactly why or how they give a particular answer to a particular question. They are developing really rapidly and, and uh, continue to sort of improve um, quickly. Those of you that have tracked this know that they released ChatGPT3 in November and ChatGPT4 in March, uh, and the differences were, were staggering. I think ChatGPT3 scored in the 10th percentile uh, on the LSATs and ChatGPT4 scored in the 90th percentile on the LSATs. So this technology is changing um, very quickly. Um, they don't always cite sources unless you ask them to. Um, and even then, sometimes they're vulnerable to something called hallucination, which um, Hannah's going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but they make things up, including sources uh, and, and including articles in sources that are real, um, but just fabricated articles. Um, but it also just makes things up uh, and states them as facts, and then they are they are vulnerable to that. Um, uh, ChatGPT and uh, and the Bing chatbot that uh, is based on ChatGPT do not access the internet in real time. Bard does, so there are some differences. Um, and I think we can expect a lot of integrations with a lot of other tools. For example, uh, the the the, bar, the uh, Bing chatbot is already being integrated across um, the Office suite. Um, oh, sorry about that, Stacey. Didn't realize my mic was was doing that. Um, image generators. So uh, another kind of uh, of uh, AI uh, tool that we've seen in recent weeks uh, in recent months rather uh, emerge are um, AI engines that can produce um, and fabricate images like the like the Puffy Pope that we just saw, including Dali, um, Midjourney, um, and a tool called Stable Diffusion. There are a variety of others uh, as well. Um, Dolly, just to give you a sense, you know, you give it an input in natural language, um, and then it produces uh, an image um, and in that uh, what you've asked for. You can ask it to, to produce things in a particular style. Um, and just to give you a sense of how quickly this particular technology changed and, and advanced, these were um, products of what was called a, a generative adversarial network. Um, many of you probably remember the website, this, this person does not exist.com or which face is real.com, where you could uh, compare an authentic image of a, of a, of a, of a person uh, with an algorithmically produced image of a person. And, and as you can see, you know, they're, they're, they're reasonably convincing, but much less so than what we have in 2023. These are some images created by Midjourney um, uh, of 
of Trump's non-existent uh, arrest in the streets of New York or Trump in prison. Um, and these are some uh, AI generated models um, uh, that were created in, in March as well. Uh, so the differences are pretty, uh, pretty dramatic. Um, just a few quick takeaways on these image generators. Um, some, as you can see, are more realistic than others. Some are uh, designed to produce more digital art than, than photos, um, but, but some are approaching photo quality uh, and are already pretty difficult to, to detect, especially in passing uh, on social media. Um, they have lots of uh, you know, productive uses, lots of positive uses. They have lots of disruptive uses across a lot of industries, for example, in the modeling industry. Um, and uh, they're also though, you know, being quickly adopted by bad actors. We've seen people sort of jump on these tools very quickly. Uh, and like image generators, video generators, I think are, are on the horizon. There's already some, some tools in development where you may be able to um, describe in natural language a video clip and have AI generate that. So I think we should just anticipate that and expect that. Uh, and also help students really grapple with the, the radical changes to the nature of digital evidence that, uh, that these tools represent. Um, and I think it's essential to, to prepare students for, you know, for this new information reality. Uh, for example, um, some graduate students in computer science recently catfished people on Reddit uh, as an experiment to see if they could uh, engage with them and, and get them to uh, to DM and even pay for additional photos of, a, of an AI generated um, person, non-existent person. So how do we engage students around you know, mis and disinformation? I think it's really important uh, at the outset to, to, to demonstrate impact and to get buy-in from students. They have to care about mis and disinformation and see it as a legitimate problem um, and something that uh, they want to be invested in learning about uh, I think that's essential kind of up top. And one way to do that is to underscore stories where mis and disinformation have done harm. Uh, here are several recent pieces that was from March. This was uh, just recently here in April um, that misinformation can actually contribute to lower life expectancy. Uh, this piece in Wired, which we featured in the SIFT, uh, our newsletter for educators, um, talks about a small town that was overrun with conspiracy theorists who were engaged in an offshoot of QAnon in the Netherlands. Um, so if you haven't uh, signed up for the SIFT, uh, those are the kinds of stories that, that we can you know, help you curate and, and, and bring to your attention and you can use in the classroom. So that's one strategy, right, to get students engaged. Um, but I think beyond that, um, I wanted to just offer a couple of useful analogies that have emerged uh, and, and gotten a little more traction in, in I think, the last year. One is thinking about this in terms of pollution. Um, uh, we've you know, made this comparison in, in, in previous years, um, comparing misinformation, particularly shared on social media as kind of polluting information streams. And that's an analogy I think you can work with, with students um, in, in a lot of ways and have them analyze some of the similarities between pollution as a problem and misinformation as a problem. It's a, it's a term that uh, was taken up um, in this recent text, uh, Fighting Fake News, um, which has a number of, of lesson plans as well uh, that are ready to use in the classroom. Jeffrey Wilhelm, Michael Smith, uh, Hugh Kesson, and Deborah Avalon um, uh, just, just released this uh, just, just in recent months. Um, another analogy that I think is useful is thinking about misinformation as a kind of cognitive pathogen that's trying to uh, bypass your cognitive defenses and, and infect your mind. Uh, this is very similar to, you know, um, an offshoot of the, the work of, of cognitive immunology and um, folks like the, the Mental Immunity Project, which is a new uh, effort, um, are really um, sort of deepening the thinking around, around that metaphor. And also psychologists like Sander van der Linden and his new book, Foolproof, um, are really exploring um, that uh, um, how how cognitive defenses can can uh, can be can be uh, boosted and our cognitive immune systems can be strengthened um, by some careful and uh, um, uh, controlled exposure to misinformation. So similar to the way you might get a vaccine to boost your immune system against. 
uh, a pathogen. Um, uh, I think this book uh, and, and um, some other work is really looking at how we can expose um, students to misinformation in a careful and controlled way to boost um, their immunity to, to misinformation. Um, taxonomies uh, or, or systems of categoriz categorization are another way that we can think about mis and disinformation. Um, this started, you know, this work started a long time ago. Uh, in a paper in 1944, R.H. Knapp sort of started to break down different kinds of misinformation and rumors uh, in the post-war period. He talked about dread rumors, wish rumors, and wedge driving rumors in that work. Um, Cass Sunstein um, also thought about four types of propagators, so who shares misinformation um, in his book on rumors. And Craig Silverman and his report sort of brings those together and thinks a lot about that kind of body of work in rumor theory. And there's a real value to that. We have a lesson on our Checkology Virtual Classroom um, with Dr. Claire Wardle, where we adopt her uh, uh, misinformation um, taxonomy that she published, um, uh, uh, known at the time as information uh, disorder. It's a, it's, a, it's a body of work that she has built on uh, over time. Um, and we've, you know, find it useful to help, help students think about different kinds of misinformation, what makes something false. So we looked at several examples of false context or fabricated content or manipulated content. Uh, and the lesson on Checkology kind of walks you through those five types that we've, we've sampled from, from Dr. Wardle's work. Uh, we also have a lesson about conspiratorial thinking. So if you want to help students understand some of the reasons why um, people are vulnerable to conspiratorial thinking. Um, compelling stories are attractive. Simplified explanations for complex phenomenon are attractive. Um, a sense of belonging in online communities are attractive. Um, that's uh, a, another very useful way to, to approach um, uh, helping them really make sense of, of the appeal and the traction that the conspiracy theories can get, but also to be aware of when they're sort of tempted by a conspiratorial claim and to understand why. And finally, digital verification skills and, and teaching students to be fact checkers, I think, is a really effective approach to engaging mis and disinformation in the classroom. Um, you know, five examples of, of skills that, that we have um, materials on, and some of these have tutorials. Uh, actually, I think all of these have tutorials in the Checkology Virtual Classroom. Helping students engage in critical observation, just noticing details like we did in, in that uh, Ramble Rants post. Um, using lateral reading um, as a strategy, getting off the page uh, that you're trying to evaluate, getting away from the source you're trying to evaluate and read about it elsewhere and other credible sources, doing reverse image searches, effectively using web archivers, even doing some simple geolocation can be really um, empowering. And we do have uh, challenges and tutorials and missions um, built out in Checkology that, that engage those skills as well. So if you haven't seen those, definitely check them out. Um, uh, and obviously, Rumor Guard builds a, a little bit of that uh, uh, fact-checking skills as well with our with our five factors there. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things here as before I run out of time um, uh, in research. I think it's vitally, vitally important. Um, you can you know look up this paper uh, and and read it at length. But but one thing I wanted to take away is that. Um, I think a lot of instruction about mis and disinformation focuses on the cognitive drivers of mis and disinformation, um, but we don't always remember that there are also socio-effective drivers or uh, social drivers of mis and disinformation. Um, people's identities get wrapped up in what they see online, in what they share, uh, and I think um, this recent piece of research points out that um, risk factors can drive people's exposure and their belief and their sharing. Um, but but uh, sometimes people share, if you look at that bottom line, uh, after being exposed to a piece of misinformation um, without believing. So sometimes people share things um, that they know are not true, but they think are, um, are funny, uh, that they think make an effective partisan point, that they think harms their ideological adversaries. Uh, and I think that's that's really important. Um, you know, significant portion of of amplification around misinformation comes from those who do believe what they see, but there is some sharing. Again, drawing on that more social side of uh, misinformation and disinformation, and the traction it gains in communities online 
um, some people share uh, knowingly, uh, knowing that it's false. And so taking action, we do have a number of resources that help students take action around um, mis and disinformation, uh, a great infographic about how to speak up uh, without starting a showdown. If you see something that's false, how to engage people uh, and really start to, to, to put these kind of skills to use. Um, and then uh, also how to really vet sources um, that they find. And it's this next piece uh, that Hannah is going to focus on um, in, this, in this next uh, section of the webinar. So Shaylin, I don't know if we're going to pause here for Q&A or if we just need to swing right into yeah, I think uh, Hannah's I think, part. I think Hannah can start setting up. There are a few questions that I'm going to hold on to, but um, while Hannah is setting up here, Jay asked, "How do you at NLP distinguish between misinformation and unpopular people or topics? For example, all major news and media that banned any discussion about the source of COVID-19 in 2020 and early 2021 as misinformation, then changed their minds when later evidence supported the early claims." It was created in a lab. Where is the boundary between legitimate discussion and we don't want to hear those voices on the left or right? Um, so I think, you know, news organizations like like everyone else um, kind of share the the consensus of experts and, and the best available information at the time. I, I don't think the there is any consensus around the origins of of COVID. Uh, 19. Um, I think that uh, for the most part, when we're talking about mis and disinformation at NLP and the kinds of examples you see on Rumor Guard, they are demonstrable falsehoods, right? So we can find that photo several years ago. Um, and uh, uh, if it's a statement of fact that, that can be checked and there's evidence that, that, that proves it's false, um, then, you know, I think you're, you can safely call it mis and disinformation. So that's generally our, our standard um, at NLP when we, when we use those terms. Great. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much, Peter. We will hold some of the other questions um, that were in the chat until Hannah is done. Um, Hannah, as you know, uh, is on Peter's team and develops much of the content um, that's in the SIFT the news goggles, um, which is definitely on the Misinfo 101 page. Also the new exercise that I know you're gonna touch upon. Um, all of the questions will hold to the end, Hannah, so we will keep watch for you. Okay, great. Everyone can hear me okay and see my screen? Looks great. All good. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so Peter has, I think, provided us with a really useful kind of framework for thinking about how to teach students about misinformation, and he touched a bit on the impact of generative AI on the misinformation landscape. So I think we've kind of highlighted so far how many different sources and types of content we're coming across. And I think all of this just really underscores the importance of learning to evaluate sources of information. Um, so much of what we consider misinformation is what we would call user-generated content. And when we think about user-generated content versus standards-based news, some key differences emerge that I think are important to, to talk about. Um, so we want to think about, you know, what makes standards-based sources different from other types of content online? User-generated content and standards-based news, we can kind of think of them as, you know, inhabiting two different spheres or living in two separate universes. And they require a different set of questions when we think about credibility. User-generated content, you know, has no concern for fairness or accuracy or the truth, whereas quality news organizations are aspiring to ethical guidelines and, and standards like verification and fairness and seeking out multiple sources. Um, for example, you know, quality news organizations take factual inaccuracies really seriously, and journalists can lose their jobs for failing to meet these, you know, rigorous standards for accuracy. So I think the question then becomes, how can I vet a news source for these signs of credibility? In our work, um, people sometimes will ask us for a list of trustworthy sources that they can either share with students or use in their own news consumption. But news literacy isn't really about teaching students which sources of information are credible. It's more so teaching them about what credibility means and what it looks like so that they can recognize it. 
And on that note, we're going to give you um, a quick run through of an activity we've developed on Checkology, our free e-learning platform called Is It Legit? Evaluating News Sources. Um, so the steps and the kind of tips in this activity are for news sources in particular, but a lot of the skills and approaches that we use here, I think, uh, can absolutely be used to fact check other kinds of, of information online, including the responses and the citations that an AI chatbot might be generating, or in some cases, as Peter alluded to, totally making up, um, which we'll get into a little bit more in just a little bit. So I want to start with the learning objectives for Is It Legit, just to give you an understanding of you know, what students should be able to do by the end of this activity. Those objectives include you know, I can describe five steps to evaluate news sources. I can assess news sources for signs of credibility. And then those essential questions include things like, how can we know what news sources to trust? And, uh, you know, why do certain practices or standards make some news sources more trustworthy than others? You know, I think we often tell students that one of the most powerful tools they can use when they're fact checking something they see online is to do a simple internet search. Um, and we might even teach them, you know, to filter for news by clicking the news tab. But now, once they have this list of search results, they have to actually decide what to click on. And I think it's important to consider maybe the thinking that's required there. Um, you know, like, does the Associated Press mean something different to them than a satire site like the Babylon Bee um, if it's all listed in the same search results or on a social media feed? So I don't think students are necessarily familiar with news brands um, and don't know about the reputation, for example, of the Associated Press or Reuters or the BBC. And everything can really look and feel very much the same in those search results and on social media. So this activity kind of, it aims to help students evaluate sources that might be unfamiliar to them um, and recognize signs of credibility and also spot red flags that signal a source should be avoided. This activity is actually based on an infographic, which I think Peter had on the screen in one of his slides. Um, that we developed last year in partnership with Smart News. So we outline on this infographic a series of five steps that students follow to vet news sources. I just wanted to list those steps briefly because we're only going to look at one of them today. So those steps are do a quick search, look for standards, check for transparency, examine how errors are handled, and then assess news coverage. In this activity, students watch short videos um, about each step, and then they put that step into practice through an assessment or a series of assessments. Uh, so to give you just a better idea, kind of the look and feel of these videos, we're going to watch the short clip that discusses step number one, which is do a quick search. Okay, step one should be really easy to remember. Do a quick search. I know, I know, it might sound like a no-brainer, right? But doing just one simple search can make all the difference and can often save you from even needing to do the other steps. Now, when I say search, I'm not talking about searching on social media. Be sure to go to a search engine like Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, and see what other legitimate sources have to say about the news source you're evaluating. This is called lateral reading, a term first introduced by researchers at Stanford University. Journalists and fact checkers use this skill all the time to assess information online. It's a game changer. Let me show you what I mean. Recently, I came across this TikTok video about a dad reportedly helping his daughter practice ballet. Seems pretty fun and harmless, right? But I noticed this label at the bottom that said Russian state-controlled media. Um, what? It was posted by an account called In The Now, which seems to post a lot of these feel-good type stories. But when I go to their profile, all I see is a bio that says, kindness is dope. I mean, agreed, it totally is, but that doesn't tell me anything about this account. So to find out about this source, the quickest and easiest thing I can do is open a new tab or hop over to Google to do a search. When I type in the now in my search bar, I get a lot of results, but I really want the most credible 
reliable sources. So I'm going to tweak my search terms and click the News tab to narrow my results. Other news sources clearly call its credibility into question. They say it's controlled by the Russian government and is connected to another source called RT. And hey, a quick search of RT gives us another clear answer. These sources are state controlled and funded by the Russian government. That means they're not independent or free of government influence and they can't be trusted as a credible source. So hey, while these videos may seem harmless, we need to be skeptical and critical of everything they publish. That's because state controlled media doesn't exist to inform you. It exists to influence you in some way, you know, to make the sponsoring government look good or to make other governments, certain groups or certain ideas look bad. Okay, great. Before we move on, I just wanted to highlight here, you might have noticed in that video clip that the searches that we modeled made use of some internet tips like using quotation marks in your Google search or clicking the news tab during your search. And I just wanted to say that we have um, these tips and several other really useful search tips on our Google Like a Pro or Search Like a Pro resources. And those resources are featured as part of the Misinfo 101 course. So after students watch this video, uh, they are taken to an assessment and it's basically their turn to use what they've learned and investigate an unfamiliar source. In this case, Global Times. Um, in this activity, most of the assessments are multiple choice, but we do have select all that apply as well as a short answer question, which we'll get to at the end. On this particular assessment, we really remind students that we don't want them to go to Global Times. We do not want them to go to the website itself. We want them to look for information in new tabs. So I wanted to give this example a shot and if you would, if you're able to just pause here and open some new tabs and do a quick search to see what you can find out about the Global Times. Um, remember, you don't want to go to the website. You want to open new tabs and search for information from other credible sources. So Shaylin, if you want to activate that poll question, folks can enter their answer as they take a couple minutes to uh, do a quick search. Yeah, and the poll it. question, yeah, it's the same as the assessment. Go ahead, Shannon. That's exactly. Yes. So that poll should pop up. Um, uh, yeah. And the great thing is I am going to show them because I know you do do uh, a lot of tutorials in our check center. So I'm going to show them how to, to find not only your uh, is it legit that you just shared, but also your tutorials, I think, are brilliant um, and definitely a place for for those to start. But while people are, are kind of doing this search and answering the question, Hannah, somebody made a good point and I completely agree as a mother of a freshman daughter, 14, who thinks social media is more credible than reliable news source journalists. I, I think kids don't understand that journalists follow standards. Have you have you seen that? What are some ways that we can um, uh, help teach them, help support them that uh, social media, while there are credible news organizations on social media, um, uh, definitely standards of quality journalism is one to to take in regards there. What what do you think? What do you think about that comment in the chat? Yeah, I mean, I think what you're describing makes total sense to me. I, you know, on social media, we're getting a lot of these personal narrative counts of someone's opinion or of them commenting on a news event or um, taking a stance on some issue. I think students really care about, you know, social issues and things going on in their world and they care about current events and the spaces where they're getting their news or getting their information is often social media. So it can just feel credible, um, even if it's not. And I think the kind of the distinction that you're making there, Shaylin, is just, you know, user generated content, people that are making a TikTok video are not held to the professional standards that yeah journalists are. Um, you know, my background is in journalism. I was a reporter at the Minneapolis Star Tribune before joining NLP. And I had those society professional journalists code of ethics packed onto my desk. And it was right in front of me as I was doing my work. And I knew these are the these are the ethics I'm aspiring to. And there are professional repercussions for for falling short of them. So yeah. Um, I'm gonna leave it up for 20 more seconds. Um uh, yeah. 
And I'm not, I'm not sure. Can you see the results yet or, or not? Yes, yet? I can. Yeah, yeah can. it looks like. Yep. We'll just go ahead. I, it looks okay. like lots of people have already weighed in about half of the folks here have weighed in. Um, if you have if you answered no, this source is not credible. You are correct. Uh, the Global Times, if you're not familiar with this, is a is a publication of People's Daily, which is a, a state run news agency that's controlled by the communist government of China. It's it's not independent. It's used by the government to promote the interests of the Chinese state. Um, and we emphasize in this activity that credible sources should be independent, meaning that the information they produce is not subject to you know undue influence or or conflicts of interest. Yeah. I'll go ahead and minimize those. Go ahead. Yeah, minimize that. Um, I, I'm not sure. I did share results, as Hannah said, um, and you, yes, you minimize it. So no more gray box. Good to go. All right. Everything looks great, Hannah. Yeah, great. So I wanted to pause here and take a moment to address uh, generative AI chatbots like ChatGPT, which Peter touched on earlier. You know, I think just in a matter of a few short months, these have been getting so much attention. And you might have students who ask a chatbot this question about a source's credibility. So I think it's good to think about as educators, you know, what kinds of considerations should we have? Um, can students trust answers that they get from a chatbot? These are our questions and teachable moments that I think we need to be ready for um, as the technology advances and, and becomes more common. So we know, as Peter mentioned, that chatbots have been shown to have huge problems with truthfulness and reliability. And as a case study, I just wanted to show you what happened when I asked ChatGPT this exact question from the assessment, is the Global Times credible? And at a glance, you can see on screen, you know, this answer might seem okay. It described the Global Times as a Chinese state-run newspaper and, and notes that it's considered to be a mouthpiece for the CCP. Um, but then I asked ChatGPT, to provide me with some sources that it used for this answer. And that's when things got kind of strange. Uh, take a look at the source that I have outlined in red here on the screen. ChatGPT goes into a lot of detail and even includes these partial quotes from an article that it says was published by the New York Times in 2020. There's a big problem though. I could not find this article, and I'm not sure it even exists. So this hyperlink, you can see it at the bottom of the red box. I clicked it. It took me to you know a page that didn't exist on the New York Times website. I entered in some key terms from the partial quote um, and looked in the New York Times archive, still nothing. I went to Google and did a web search um, following kind of these same steps, pulling from that direct quote, looking in the time frame where, that it said the article was published. Still nothing. So, you know, what happened here? Did ChatGPT just invent this article? I think it's a definite possibility because it has absolutely done this kind of thing before. Um, you know, we know that these concerns about AI chatbots citing non existent articles from legitimate news outlets, like Peter noted, have already been documented. Um, like when ChatGPT invented a sexual harassment allegation against a real law professor and then cited a made up Washington Post article as evidence. Um, or when the Guardian here at the top of the screen, you can see, found that ChatGPT was citing Guardian articles and its responses that do not exist. So AI experts refer to these errors that are presented with confidence as AI hallucinations. Peter kind of gave you a quick definition earlier. And that's the thing that I think can be really confusing and concerning, um, especially for students and the public, is that unlike, you know, a list of search results that you're getting when you just do a quick internet search, that we're combing through these results, and yeah, they might still include some questionable sources that we need to weed out. Uh, these chatbots are presenting the answers as definitive, and they feel authoritative. So then you can end up with really authoritative sounding misinformation or authoritative sounding, but totally made up sources. And it's not just, just a chat GPT, Google's Bard, you can see here, um, and Microsoft Bing's chatbots also have huge problems when it comes to truthfulness and reliability. And I think this is a problem the companies are obviously aware of. When I went to test BARD, I took this screenshot. You can see that there's this you know, note that says the responses could be inaccurate or inappropriate. And it tells me when in doubt, 
just Google it essentially to, to fact check Bard's responses. Um, so I think if nothing else, this really underscores that we, you know, need these search skills to evaluate sources more than ever. Just, you know, there was a study published in April, just this month by the Center for Countering Digital Hate and found that Google's Bard had some really concerning problems when they tested it uh, on false narratives. A huge chunk of those, the chatbot repeated uh, without adding additional context on subjects like vaccines, racism, sexism, LGBTQ plus hate. So some really concerning things. Microsoft Bing's chatbot, I don't know if anyone's played around with this chatbot in particular, it operates a little bit differently in that it provides some citations and footnotes for all of the responses that it gives you. But I wanted to highlight this screenshot. As Microsoft seems to be acknowledging here, even though the responses aim to pull from reliable sources, that's not always the case. Um, and even when it does pull from reliable sources, the chatbot can still distort or misrepresent what it's finding in those sources. So like with Bard, Bing here is kind of warning us to double check the facts before making decisions or taking action. For example, there was a recent Washington Post story where reporters asked Bing's chatbot about a volunteer combat medic in Ukraine and the bot reported back that this medic was dead. And as proof, it cited an article from Pravda, which is a Russian propaganda outlet. This person is very much alive. This is not correct. And when I tried to kind of replicate this question using Bing's chatbot, um, Bing still reported incorrectly that this person was dead. But as evidence, rather than citing Russian propaganda to me, it cited what seemed to be very legitimate news sources, the Wall Street Journal, CBS News, um, but I didn't find in either of these sources that it's citing any indication that this medic was dead. And its top sources here in this response is, you know, bogus and false claims from Twitter, which are unreliable user-generated posts. So can we trust these chatbots or not? I, you know, ChatGPT, if you, just think through the differences here, offer citations if you ask for them, but it also has made up imaginary sources. Bard sometimes offers sources. Bing's answers do include citations, but those citations can be questionable or misinterpreted. And there's real concerns about these responses supporting conspiracy theories and misinformation. So I think from what we've seen from this technology so far, the importance of news literacy in being able to evaluate sources becomes even clearer. And these skills, you know, are more vital than ever. So the same types of questions apply that we look at in an activity like, is it legit? Are these sources, does it cite sources, first of all? What are these sources? Are these sources even real? Are they credible? How do you know? And I think it can feel very overwhelming. This technology is changing so fast and trying to keep up with this technology is a lot. Um, but no matter how the technology changes, we're always going to need to answer these kinds of questions. And there's something I think reassuring about that. So just to kind of recap before I kick it back to Shaylin for Q&A, um, jumping back to the Is It Legit activity, students, once they've worked through all of the steps, answered the assessments, they're taken to this final assessment, which is a short answer question where they evaluate an unfamiliar source and explain why it isn't or isn't credible and describe the process they followed. Uh, yeah, so before I kick it back to Shaylin, does anyone have any questions? I know Shaylin's going to explain where exactly to find this activity, how to assign the Misinfo 101 course on Checkology, but I'll just, I'll pause here. You know, Hannah, you'll have to go back through and skim the chat, especially at the end here when you're talking about chatbots and people looking at apps and, you know, taking, taking the advice from, uh, you know, financial advice and it turns to ruins. I mean, you'll have to go through there and, and read it. It's, it is, yes, it, it's a little scary, you know, as an educator, um, you know, and this one could be both you and Peter, um, what impact will Twitter's branding and PR and public television as state sponsored and what can we do about it? 
um, Marla asked that question during your discussion. So I'm going to pose that to the group along with a couple others that I pulled out. Peter, I'll throw you under the bus and make you pick the uh, the Twitter question. Can you read Elon Musk's mind? What is what is next for Twitter and journalism? It's hard to know. Um, I think there's a real lesson there, though. I think the labels were were something like um, state affiliated, and then they changed it to government funded, just to differentiate between you know NPR and and say RT or Pravda or something like that. I think it's an opportunity, first and foremost, to engage students around some of those differences and look at what state controlled propaganda news outlets are and how NPR and, and PBS um, differ from that. Uh, uh, and then to think about how those those labels might be misleading for NPR, for the CBC, for the BBC. Um, and to, you know, it's just to engage that topic, what the future of you know, news organizations on Twitter, they do bring a lot of value to the platform. They drive a lot of traffic. I think NPR understands that and, and that's part of their, their exodus and protest here. So I think it, you know, it just remains to be seen um, uh, how, how that will be uh, resolved. Yeah. Um, Hannah, this came again during your dis discussion. Um, Dexter asks, Wikipedia mentions the Global Times as controlled by the Chinese government. Since we often turn to Wikipedia first for a fast read, how should we view that source? Can one assess whether the wiki write-up is legit or itself a fake? Hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, I remember in my time in school, educators that I had in class were very anti-Wikipedia or cautioned, you know, you to just use it as a starting point. And I think Wikipedia can be a really useful starting point, especially if the information you're finding has footnotes at the bottom of the entry that you can then do your own checking on, right? And do some lateral reading there and click on the footnotes and see what sources it, the Wikipedia entry is citing. Um, but it is an extremely useful search tool. And I think it's a good starting point. Um, there are some important caveats for Wikipedia, for example, not all news organizations are going to have an entry there, especially local news organizations. And I think non-English versions of Wikipedia have also had some have some problems that have been identified by researchers, but it can be a really useful starting point. Thank you. Um, Jennifer in the chat said, students seem to want to be entertained as opposed to be informed. And it creates a challenge for educators. Being informed is so much work. Uh, do we see students wanting to be, um, you know, entertained? Do they not care about the news? Do they not care about credible sources? Do they just want entertainment? I, I think that's a broad challenge. I think the the, the escalation of um, and the sophistication of entertainment media and social media designed to engage us, driven by algorithms that learn what engages us is quite different than, than previous generations. And so I, I would say teaching students about that and helping them understand how they are targeted, how powerful TikTok's algorithm is, how powerful Meta's algorithms are and Twitter's and the platforms that they use uh, are trying to keep them on platform. There's a reason you're up scrolling late at night watching YouTube over and over and consuming ads. That's the revenue model. So making sure they understand that making sure they understand that they have a greater challenge than previous generations in sort of turning that off and cultivating a, a healthy media diet when all the tools and platforms around them are trying to you know, force feed them junk information all the time, uh, I think might be one way to, to start. But it is definitely a bigger challenge now than ever before. But they do have more access to more credible sources of information than ever before. So if you can somehow underscore the role that credible information plays in their lives and how civically empowering that is, I think that's that's some places to begin. Yeah, great point. Jamie said in the chat, her students definitely do care about the news. So um, kudos, Jamie, that talks about uh, you as an educator instilling that. Um, a, a million dollar question everybody wants to know. It's facing educators across the country, no matter what discipline they are in. Uh, what about those of us who work in places where there's a significant number of students' family who actually believe mis and, dis mis and disinformation? Blowback is a real thing. So so how do we approach this in the classroom when uh, it's, it's tumultuous times here? Um, some thoughts on that, pieces of advice.
Yeah, and I, th I think Brittany shared an infographic that we kind of created around this exact topic last year. Uh, it's called Teaching News Literacy in Polarizing Times. I don't know if you have that link handy, Brittany, uh, but we'll reshare that in the chat. And I definitely understand this concern. My, you know, my sister is a public school teacher in a small town in Illinois and has told me many stories about not even feeling like she can teach about the election because students are so emotionally reactive in ways that they weren't even five years ago. Um, mm -hmm. So there are some really good tips that we outline in the infographic about uh, approaches you can take to kind of set the ground rules Oh, it looks like maybe, oh, you're pulling up something else, Shaylin. Um, no, keep going, keep going. Yeah, and I think focusing on journalism standards is a really empowering way to approach this, um, and especially in teaching news literacy. I think focusing on standards rather than, um, yeah. Peter, I don't know if you have other things to add. I, I was just gonna add, I think framing misinformation and disinformation as fundamentally exploitative right so they are targeted at people's most deeply held beliefs and values so misinformation that seems to uphold a liberal position on an issue or a conservative position on an issue doesn't help liberals or conservatives respectively it targets them and uses them as amplification tools right to push their networks so i think underscoring to students that they and their parents are trusted intermediaries in their social networks and misinformation is trying to capitalize on their credibility and get them to repeat something and to put their imprimatur on it to attach it to their credibility. And I think, you know, if some particular examples or issues or topics are too hot, you can look at some of the common strategies. That's where those taxonomies come into play, right? Teach them about false context to at least develop that habit of mind and use examples of false context that are more benign or politically neutral so that they're ready cognitively when, you know, and, and, and in their information habits and dispositions when they encounter something that's, you know, manipulated content or false context uh, about a political topic. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. Um, I know myself and Brittany, we continuously uh, echo to educators and uh, district leaders. The great thing about working at NLP, we have a uh, great free re resources for the general public as well, including a checkology. We have rumor guard, we have apps. So, uh, you know, communities, families, those those parents can learn alongside their students. We're very transparent. Um, and so we have lots of great resources that support both students and the general public at large. Um, thank you so much, Hannah and Peter. Fascinating. I think we could speak the whole night. Um, so, such great discussions. Um, definitely will. We'll see if there's an easy way. Um, we'll talk with Katie tomorrow and see if there's an easy way to, to, to share the chat as well. Um, because I know that was requested, but definitely a fantastic night. Um, I did want to, to um, share uh, with everyone. Um, first, on the, the Google Doc that is being shared uh, in the chat, um, you will see a link to our Misinfo 101 page. Uh, this is right off of our main website. <clears throat> You'll see about this webinar, the course that we put on Checkology, more resources. Um, so it's definitely there for you to explore um, uh, along with other resources on the Google document that we thought were pertinent to tonight. Um, a couple of things I wanted to point out. This is a teacher dashboard. So we are on the inside working of Checkology. If you are new to Checkology, um, you can definitely reach out in the help center or there are links on the Google Docs to help get you started. But we have created a, a short Misinfo 101 foundational course uh, for, for you to use with your students before the school year is up. Um, and to simply assign that course, all you have to do is click on this dashboard um, and you add a class. After you add a class, uh, you give it a title. So let's call it Misinfo 101. Um, student, you can say high school, let's say we're 11th grade, subject is, is civics. Uh, once you create the class um, and you assign a course here, it defaults to Checkology 101. Uh, but right underneath this, Checkology 101 uh, is how to customize, change, or preview the course. If you choose change the course, 
This brings up not only your personal preset courses, but everything that, uh, that our team uh, has created for you. So you'll see there's a civics course, a science one, and here's the brand new Misinfo 101. And so this course is ready to go. You can see it has eight items. Uh, again, we are centering, is it legit? exercise that that Hannah is leading the learning. Um, you can either preview it or assign it. Um, and you'll see there is lots of other courses that we have preset to meet your needs. Um, but if you want to preview it, you simply hit the preview. It tells you uh, the course objectives, the descriptions, what lessons are in it, as well as what challenges are in it. So there is Hannah's is a legit challenge, um, conspiratorial thinking, which Peter referenced during his discussion. Uh, and I know, Brittany, we had some science educators. We did include those in our Ms. Info 101 because they are fantastic uh, brand new releases this year, but also very important skills in those for all students to, to check out. So uh, misinfo 101 and that's how you get to that course so again after you have assigned a course you simply go to change course scroll down to misinfo 101 and assign it and that will be assigned to your students so very easy we have lots of support it's on the document uh, if you reach out in the help center you will get our colleague kim kim who will walk you through it um, I know we are we are ending. Uh, we are five minutes over, but I did want to share one more thing underneath the Check Center because we referenced this. We love the Check Center. Uh, it has fabulous tutorials within the Check Center to help build those habits of mind for online information, uh, discerning reliable, relevant sources. But I really like this skills section. And if you click on the skills section underneath the Check Center, you'll see we have all of these fabulous tutorials that Peter was referencing earlier. Everything from reverse image search to lateral reading uh, to how to search like a pro. And they are all shared uh, uh, in our check center underneath the tutorials and you can share them through uh, a link that you can put on your LMS. You can email it many different ways to get this in the hands of your students. Um, but it's a fantastic set collection of skills that students um, should definitely acquire before they, they leave our school. Um, so again, that's in the check center underneath the toolbox and the skills has all of the tutorials. So I know that was extremely quick. Uh, I saw a question pop up. Uh, Aaron or Brittany, do you want to, to share any questions um, before I uh, close out the webinar here? No, I don't have anything to add. Just a thank you to everyone for joining us. Great. Well, thank you everyone for um, joining us this evening. We are thrilled and uh, you will be sent an email on Monday, not only with the link to the recording, but going to talk to Peter and Hannah about getting you um, some sort of version of, of the, the slides because that was requested numerous times. Um, so we'll see what we can do on our end along with the chat. But um, thank you again, Hannah and Peter, and uh, have a great rest of the week. Uh, summer's coming quickly. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night.